Today's show was supported by Pipeline, coming to movie theaters this October. Lincoln Center Theater's acclaimed staging tackles the school-to-prison pipeline, depicts a mother's hopes for her son and their clash with an educational system rigged against him. Hailed as potent and intensely acted by the New York Times, Pipeline is available in select theaters nationwide October 3rd, 5th, and 7th. Visit PipelineInCinema.com for tickets and more information, including a powerful one-minute trailer. That's PipelineInCinema.com. And now, welcome to this episode of the award-winning Best of the Left podcast, in which we shall learn about where we stand now 10 years on from the beginning of the Great Recession in 2008. Inequality has spiked. Banks are more profitable than ever, and not a single banker went to jail for fraud. And we also look ahead to how we can better manage the next inevitable crash. Clips today come from The Bradcast, This Is Hell, The Brian Lehrer Show, Start Making Sense, The Laura Flanders Show, The Real News Network, The Ralph Nader Radio Hour, and The Inquiry. Mark your calendars, it's been 10 years since the collapse of Lehman Brothers. One of the voices saying that it could happen all over again, she was actually on the scene for that. And I hope I'm pronouncing her name correctly. Madeline Antonchik was the chief risk officer at Lehman Brothers from 2002 until 2007. Here's part of what she had to say in the New York Times today. Quote, Lehman knew precisely the risks it was taking. It was my job to know those risks and communicate them to the rest of the senior leadership team. There came a time when they were not interested in hearing what I had to say. And Lehman lost its way. Risk management was repeatedly overruled. Okay, we've seen a lot of regulations since then. What about that? Quote, the unintended consequence is that risk has shifted away from banks to less transparent, unregulated entities. For example, The increase in capital requirements have helped feed the so-called shadow banking system because new rules limit banks from making leveraged loans. Hedge funds and private equity firms have taken up the slack and provide direct financing. This is hardly the outcome, she says, intended by the regulators. This peer-to-peer lending is not regulated in the same way banks are, and moving this lending to shadow banks reduces transparency to regulators. Then she says, to me, the biggest risk of all has not been adequately addressed. What I learned from the layman experience is the importance of governance. Leadership is about doing the right thing, and no one should go unchallenged when they're about to make a questionable decision. This culture of checks and balances is still lacking in many organizations. Meanwhile, Alan Scherter at CBS Money Watch is tallying the signs we are on the precipice. Again, check out his list. The share of national income captured by the richest 10% of Americans rose from 34% in 1980 to 47% in 2016. Between 1980 and 2016, the share of America's income going to the top 1% nearly doubled while that going to the bottom 50% plunged. After declining following the Depression, the top 1% share of wealth in the U.S. has shot back up roughly to where it was in the 1930s. Between 1970 and 2016, the gap between the richest and poorest Americans jumped 27 percentage points. 27 percentage points. Last point, as of 2017, by some measures, CEOs at large companies, on average, earned more than 300 times what the typical worker made, up from 58 times in 1989 and 20 times in 1965. Let me give you that back. As of 2017, by some measures, CEOs at large companies, on average, earned more than 300 times what the typical worker made, up from 58 times in 1989 and 20 times in 1965. That is from Lehman Brothers is Long Gone, but the Economic Rot Lingers, recommended reading at the CBS News site.
You write that uh, eight years after the crisis began, the big six U.S. banks, J.P. Morgan Chase, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, collectively held 43 percent more deposits, 84 percent more assets, and triple the amount of cash they held before. The Fed has allowed the biggest banks on Wall Street to essentially double the risk that devastated the system in the financial crash of 2008. What explains why the Fed would put these banks into the position of, as you see it, inevitable failure? Why, why create the same circumstances, but this time twofold, that were seen as reasons for the financial collapse? Or does the Fed simply not believe that concentration of banking was behind the failure? Um, the Fed doesn't appear to believe that because the Fed hasn't um, throughout any of this process, and this includes the, the Fed chairs, um, Ben Bernanke, who was the, the Fed chair at the beginning of the crisis, Janet Yellen, who was the Fed chair in the middle of this process, and, and currently now Jerome Powell and Trump, who is the, the most recent chair of the Fed. None of these people um, seem to think that breaking up the banks or separating um, their deposits, i.e. our deposits, from their, their speculative or more risky activities is necessary. None of them advocate that. Um, Janet Yellen, had advocated the idea that the banking system was fine. Um, I, was, I was actually at uh, the meeting, the conference that was happening um, in, in late 2015, uh, middle 2015, before they started to raise rates or increase a little bit the cost of money where, where she said that internally, and it's been said publicly as well. Um, but, you know, they refused to believe that there's a problem, even though the Fed itself has $4.5 trillion of money subsidized in the banking system. That is historic. To put that into perspective, um, before the financial crisis, there was about three hundred thousand, uh, three hundred billion, which is a small percentage of that, sort of on offer just in case of emergencies. And now it's four and a half trillion. So that number has just gone um, completely lopsided, and and it is the same throughout the major central banks around the world. All these central bankers, all of these leaders, Mario Draghi in uh, Europe, uh, the European Central Bank head, uh, Kuroda in uh, the Bank Bank of Japan, they don't want to believe that what they have done by conjuring money to help the banking system and by keeping banks, and this is more particularly a U.S. problem, um, as complex as they are, as integrated with deposits as they are, is a problem. It's, it's, it's bizarre. But then you look back at 2007 and Ben Bernanke, who was the head of the Fed at the time, as the housing crisis was clearly um, happening. And his banks had clearly taken the mortgage loans at the time and concocted all sorts of bells and whistles around them and sold them throughout the world and lent. Uh, money to, to to people and companies and, and banks to buy them, um, you know, said everything was fine. And, and this was just sort of a blip. And yet they knew, they saw the numbers that were coming into banks. When I worked in banking, um, throughout the years, it isn't like no one had a clue as to the fact that, that certain things were going wrong. And what the banks did was say, okay, these loans are going wrong. So what we're going to do is we're going to repackage them and sell them and make money off of them. So we're okay. And whatever happens after that happens. Um, this is still the operational sort of structure that, that we have. Um, why they refuse to see this? Because they're in power. It's not their money. It's money they can fabricate. If it's not your money on the line, you tend to be a lot more blind to what could really go wrong. You write that the largest private banks, including J.P. Morgan, Deutsche Bank, and HSBC, that inhaled this cheap money from the Fed were not required to increase their lending to the Main Street economy as a condition of the availability of that money. Would Do you think they would have taken the money if they were required to give it to Main Street? Because I'm trying to determine if the Obama plan of giving this uh, you know, cheap money to these banks was something that you know was meant not to help Main Street. Could have they just said, look, give it to Main Street and they would have taken the money and Main Street would have been doing better? That's really an excellent thing. And, and um, I, um, I wrote that exact policy in, in a book I put out um, in 2009, so just as the crisis was, was really hitting its, 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 its worst moments um, with that exact idea. Like, instead of, um, and this was before trillions of dollars were available, this was just the beginning of, of what ultimately happened, that if you had instead helped, for example, those people with those mortgages, it would have had a, a, a double effect. One is it would have helped the people with the mortgages, it would help keep people in their homes, it would have been kinder, um, and it would also have been better economics, because instead of paying um, what's now $21 trillion globally, and, and lots of other bells and whistles and subsidies along the way over these years. You know, this is what's just available right now and, and, and is staying available. Um, you know, you would have paid probably a half a trillion, so a very small 5% of that, um, literally to fix every single problematic mortgage at the time. 
Um, and that would have been far cheaper, but that was not the decision. The decision was, let's write um, through these central banks, because they're theoretically independent of government policy, which is connected to banking policy, these blank, unlimited checks to these institutions, and there's still no limitations. The European Central Bank is, is continuing um, to buy corporate bonds now throughout Europe of, of the major countries and not the countries that are doing less well economically. Um, so the whole design of this process has really been not to help Main Street. Yeah, they could have. It was, emer- it, it was an emergency powers clause in the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 that basically could have given the Fed latitude to say, look, yeah, we're going to give you this money, but you have to... Um, restructure this amount of loans, uh, mortgages. You have to ultimately, as the years went on, help to cancel this amount of student debt, or you have to basically lower uh, small business loan money and make it more available to help grow the bottom part, the foundation part of the economy. Maybe the banks wouldn't have taken it. Now they won't take it. They wouldn't have taken it along the years. But I think at the time of the crisis, when they're looking at potentially closing, um, and potentially going bankrupt like the Bear Stearns or Lehman Brothers, that the banks that have remained standing um, in that situation might have accepted some of those restrictions or some of that diversion of money into the real economy. They, it wasn't an option. No one, no one, no one thought that could be a good idea um, because, again, it was it was money sort of from the top of the system that has remained at the top of the system, and there wasn't really a thought um, to putting those. Uh, you know, sort of rules in, involved in that money. So, so there's a lot of things in, in, involved in, in why this has happened. A lot of it's just elite policy that's remained elite. And, um, and I think, though, there, there was an opportunity, um, and there probably will be again in, in the next emergency crisis, where if central bankers wanted to, they could put restrictions on what can happen to the money that they provide cheaply to the major banks. I doubt they'll do it. Um, I hope they do it, and um, they should have last time. So then how would you rate uh, President Obama's bank bailout and his response to the 2008 financial crisis? After all, many Democrats praise it for leading to eight years of decreasing unemployment and eight years of stock market increases. So is the outcome of Obama's bank bailout good for the markets, good for workers, and good for banks? Um, It's good for markets and good for banks. And yes, the unemployment rate is lower, but that said, um, the, the way in which people are employed today is, is more tenuous. People have more jobs. People get less benefits. Wages have not increased um, barely at all with respect to inflation during a 10-year period, whereas the stock prices of banks have gone up by three or four times. So, um, yeah, it's good for some people, not for others. It was not just the policy of the Obama administration. It was the policy of the Federal Reserve under the Obama administration. Um, and I think the fact that we haven't had a crisis during this period is simply because um, the central banks have collusion to such a mass extent in terms of the money they fabricated that they've plastered over um, potential problems by just throwing money at them. I mean, it's like if you go to a casino and you're sitting at a blackjack table and, like, you lose the first seven hands and, you know, the guy next to you says, yeah, no problem, here's, like, 10 grand, just just keep playing, and you lose another seven, here's another 10 grand, you lose another seven, it's like, well, here's 50, um, then you have no incentive to really change. And, like, at some point, you'll start winning hands just because you've had all this money to, to help you do that. And then at some point, if you have to pay it back, there will be a real problem. So right now, the fact that this subsidy still exists and is still in place for banks have enabled the financial system to look like it's healthier. Um, it hasn't lifted the level of wages anywhere near what it could have had it been used a different way. Um, and I don't think that policy has been successful because what it has done is merely push that risk in a more consolidated, concentrated banking system into the future. Um, There wasn't another financial crisis under Obama. There may be one under President Trump. There may be one if if he goes in for another term or some other Democrat or or whomever takes that spot, Um, because nothing has been fundamentally changed in the system, and it has and continues to be subsidized by central bank policy. I was really intrigued by one effort to rethink economic indicators that you included in in your column. Um, that is how we measure GDP and revise it 
to reflect income going to the rich, to the middle class, and the poor people, and poor people separately. How would that work, and why would that be good? It, it is fascinating. Um, so uh, it would be important because, again, when we hear GDP, we assume it's saying something about most people's experiences. And if it's not, we should fix that. And it, it, GDP is not a naturally occurring phenomenon. We didn't used to measure GDP. And the effort to measure it came out of the Great Depression when people realized it was important to understand what was going on. And so I think that we should use this crisis and the longer-term trends that contributed to this crisis, like the growth in inequality, to, to improve our metrics further. GDP was a great advance. Now we should go much further. And there is an effort by a number of economists, Gabriel Zuckman, uh, Emmanuel Saez, and the most famous of them, Thomas Piketty, um, to measure GDP as the income that flows to different segments of the population. So look at how much national income goes to the bottom 10% of earners, the second 10%, etc., etc., et cetera, up to the top 10%. They've done this. Um, they're private academic economists, so it doesn't get nearly as much attention as the government doing it. Plus, they have to use data that they're approved to use, so it has about a four-year lag. But what I find intriguing is that two senators, including New York Senator and the Democratic leader, Charles Schumer, um, have a bill that would essentially have the government do this. And there's no reason the government couldn't do it, where when GDP is announced, you would get the headline number, GDP grew 3%. You would also hear that for the middle section of our economy, GDP barely grew at all. And for the bottom, it barely grew at all. And for the top, it actually grew 7%, the income, income flowing to those groups. And I think that would be a much more meaningful way to do it. And I think it's important to do it together. You don't want to do it as some separate release. You want to kind of force us as a society, in the media, politicians, to have one conversation at the same time about who our economic growth is benefiting. You know, I was thinking about another of your recent columns in relation to this, the one in which you wrote that polarization in American politics, as we usually think of it, is the wrong way to think of it, because it's not both parties are heading to the extremes, it's the Republican Party that's heading to the extremes. Um, but we do now have more of a socialist wing, explicitly self-identified socialist wing of the Democratic Party emerging, pushing things like Medicare for all and federally guaranteed jobs. I think in response to this long-term inequality, um, looking at the push for something better than just let the market recover in its market ways and then we'll be in the next bubble and then we'll you know, structurally wind up with even more inequality when – when that bursts. Uh, so maybe the Democratic Party is heading more to the left, in fact, and maybe it needs to. Yeah, I think, look, Larry Summers, the former Treasury Secretary, the former top advisor to Barack Obama when he was president, um, he's someone that I think a lot of people on the left like to beat up. They have disagreements with him. Um, and so no one thinks of they, him as They saw kind him of, as too centrist, too establishment, too pro-Wall Street, to be sure. Yes. Um, and he made a, a number of, of enemies among the Harvard faculty when he was president there. And w it, he's not the point here. But, but the point is, uh, no one would see him as some kind of radical lefty, right? And what he said to me recently, um, I think, is a really good thought. Um, people on the left might disagree with the first half of this. But he said, look, I think that the events of the 1960s and 70s and 80s should have moved an open-minded person to the right on economics. We saw essentially the socialist economies and other countries failing. We saw the um, policies of LBJ lead to inflation, not just LBJ, but we saw the policies of the government leading to inflation, all kinds of things. We saw the Clinton era where they brought down the deficit and it seemed to spark a boom work. It, on the flip side, he said, look, I think what's happened over the last 15 or 20 years should have moved an open-minded person to the left, which is we've had a growing economy, and yet it isn't lifting the living standards of most people. And and I agree with that. And so the idea that the Democratic Party is moving somewhat to the left on things like taxation, on things like um, figuring out ways to have the government create good-paying jobs, 
I think that makes sense. My point in the column in today's paper is um, the more radical ideas on the left, whether you love them or don't like them, remain not the policy of the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party is not trying to get rid of private insurance. It's not trying to take tax rates up to 70 percent. It's still willing to compromise with Republicans. It accepts science. It's not trying to prevent certain kinds of people with certain skin colors from voting. It hasn't stolen a Supreme Court seat. And so I think the the radical party in American politics today um, is the Republican Party not the Democratic Party. Today's episode is sponsored by Bombas. Thanks to two years of research and development and multiple improvements in design, performance, and comfort, Bombas are the sock company making the most comfortable socks in the history of feet. And these socks are chock full of features from their honeycomb arch support system to the cushioned footbed that's reinforced for comfort without added bulkiness. Not to mention, Bombas Stay Up technology ensures that your socks stay in place without leaving a mark. And the super soft cotton material makes you never want to take them off. Of particular interest for those of us who try to shop ethically, Bombas is a certified B corporation, which is sort of like fair trade or certified organic, but for corporate business practices and their impact on workers, suppliers, the community, and the environment. Which is to say that doing good is written right into the fabric of the company. Most famously, for every Bombas purchase you make, Bombas donates a pair to someone in need because socks are the number one requested item at homeless shelters, but it's rare that anyone thinks to donate them, so Bombas stepped in to fill that gap. So to support their mission and get 20% off your first order, go to bombas.com slash left and use the code left at checkout. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash left, offer code left, and you'll get 20% off your first order. The New York Times ran a special section on the anniversary on Sunday, and they presented 10 findings. Their number one finding was that, quote, the recovery was a disaster all over again. Seems like a great place to start, especially since we're speaking with Harold Meyerson. Of course, he's executive editor of The American Prospect and a regular contributor to the LA Times op-ed page. Harold, welcome, and I wonder if you agree that the recovery was a disaster all over again. Oh, absolutely, because the recovery intensified something that was going on before the crash and uh, was, was one of the reasons why the crash happened, which is it exacerbated the already yawning gap uh, between income going to capital and income going to labor. And since most Americans get their income from their work, this only meant that we, we had a two-speed recovery, very good for profits and for capital, and barely discernible for labor. And, of course, a great paradox, which, uh, you know, if I see one more article on this, I'm going to scream, is uh, unemployment keeps falling, and uh, wages, uh, when you factor in the cost of living, are, are still going nowhere. And for economists who only envision uh, the unemployment rate, who envision that as the only uh, thing that's connected to uh, wage levels, uh, this has been very bewildering, of course, the fact that there are effectively no more unions, the fact that uh, so much of the work now is is done by uh, temp workers and independent contractors and gig workers who have no recourse to uh, uh, bolstering incomes. I mean, all, all of this uh, is just an artifact of a disastrous, really disastrous recovery. Yeah, just a couple of facts here. The Typical middle class, middle class families net worth today is still more than $40,000 below where it was in 2007. That's according to the Federal Reserve. They also broke this down by race and ethnicity. In 2016, net worth among white middle income families was 19% below 2007 adjusted for inflation. Among blacks, it was down 40%, and among Hispanics, 46%. So if we were going to point our fingers at the worst, the worst single thing that happened uh, in the recovery, what would you point to? 
I would point to the fact that uh, 8 million families lost their homes and that the government, uh, specifically Barack Obama's Treasury Department under the uh, dubious guidance of Timothy Geithner, made it a priority to make the banks whole, which they are very whole, and did effectively nothing uh, for uh, underwater homeowners. Uh, they, they just let them uh, essentially lose their homes, uh, and uh, we are we are dealing with the... Uh, uh, the outcomes of that today. Uh, that is the single worst uh, decision, I think, uh, that came out of the uh, Obama administration in its eight years in power. Let us talk now about the political consequences of the fact that the recovery was a disaster all over again. Can we draw a line from the failure of Obama on the 8 million foreclosures and the rise of Donald Trump? Well, we can, although it's not simply the uh, the foreclosure issue. It's the uh, the fact that uh, the recovery did not extend to the uh, average American. Uh, and even as unemployment fell, wages stagnated, and the, the, the quality of jobs that were created during most of the recovery uh, were, were, it was not, you know, standard employment as people of your generation and mine conceive it. So, yes, I mean, it did two things. It It drove the Republicans right and it drove the Democrats left. And and we see that in the increasing tendency uh, on the right to blame stagnation on immigrants, other races. Uh, it, it, it exacerbated, as it has in Europe, white nationalism and racism on the right. And it moved the Democrats to the left. In, in, in 2010, Gallup started polling just in reaction to the crash on um, people's opinions of economic systems. And they found in as early as 2010 that while 53% of Democrats said that they had a favorable view of, of capitalism, an equal 53% said they had a favorable view of socialism. Now, when Gallup asked that just a few weeks ago, again, they do it every two years, they found that the percentage of Democrats who have a favorable view of socialism has risen to 57%, and the percentage of those who have a favorable favorable view of capitalism shrank to 47%. So really, this has moved uh, the center-left more to the left and the center-right more into a uh, racist nationalist fury. On the 10th anniversary of the collapse of Lehman Brothers, all sorts of post-mortems are being written about what went wrong in 2008. The thing is, post-mortems suggest that something died. And in this case, while one of the nation's largest investment firms, Lehman, is no more, the system it came to symbolize is still with us. Ten years on, the stock market teeters from height to height and developers keep building houses for gazillionaires. Low-income people keep taking on high-income debt and wages remain too low for them to do otherwise if they want to keep their cars, their health care, or their kids in college. The president, a debt-proud developer who disparages taxes, is out there riling up his mob in rally after rally. He tells everyone who'll listen that the economy's never been better, and the mad media who listen to him keep listening and repeating with minor caveats. Not long after the financial crash of 2008 and the Great Recession that followed, I heard someone say it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. Is it? At the level of mainstream economics and theory, ten years later, the supposedly smartest people in the land do retain their confidence in markets and privatization, debt, derivatives, and trickle-down growth at whatever the cost. But something has changed, and I remember sniffing a whiff of it first ten years ago. In October 2008, the veteran radio journalist and oral historian Studs Terkel died, and along with him it seemed right then that an entire world was passing of productive, waged, hard-but-worth-it work, the sort of work he documented in thousands of interviews for books like Working. Asked to MC Studs' memorial service in New York's Cooper Union, it was easy to feel grim, but as Howard Zinn reminded us that night, one of the dominant traits of Terkel was his incurable optimism. Knowing that to be true, I'd scattered about for news that might cheer us up, and I'd found some. In Turkle's hometown of Chicago, at that very moment, two dozen laid-off workers were refusing to be fired. Sent home with no notice, instead of leaving their jobs, the mostly black and Latino workers at the Republic Windows and Doors factory stayed put 
and with support from their families and their union, they were demanding what they were owed, severance, their last pay, and an honest explanation for why the business was closing down. In the wake of the public's bailout of the banks, while some started seeing recovery in the works, others, like those workers in Chicago, started wondering about something different. Not a return to the rickety old, clearly careless system, but something else. Was there a more moral, more ethical, not to say more resilient way to run a business? Today, after much toil and trouble and help from their union and lots of others, those workers own their own business. New Era Windows is worker-owned and in the black. And that's what's changed. Instead of recovering, people have started to ask, what else? And they've started experimenting. And that's what the media were missing then and what they're missing now. But we're not. Here on the show, we cover a lot of topics, but we're making sure to always be keeping our eye on the upcoming elections this year more than ever. Obviously, a regressive administration like Trump's simply cannot be allowed to govern unchecked. We're all getting ready to vote in November to take back the House, but there's more we can all do. That's why I'm happy to tell you about the work that Swing Left is doing. Nearly half a million people have already signed up to volunteer with Swing Left, and when you join at swingleft.org slash left, you'll be immediately connected with other volunteers in your area who are working to win the race in a nearby swing district. You'll find out where and how you can make the most impact on flipping the house starting right now. It's really that simple. Each of us has the power to change our country and save our democracy, but only if we do the work to take back the house. Don't just vote this year, volunteer. Join the grassroots movement that's making change in this year's midterms election by signing up at swingleft.org slash left. First, uh, before we get into the public banking proposal, uh, take a look at other public banks that may exist that we can draw on as an example, which is your solution to the next crisis. Yes. So many people in the United States are aware now that there is a large and robust public banking movement, especially since the financial crisis. This is occurring at the state level and especially at the city level. Los Angeles recently has put up a public bank for a referendum to decide whether or not they want a city bank in Los Angeles. North Dakota. Many people look at the Bank of North Dakota, which is one of the longest standing and only public banks in the United States. It was founded in the early 20th century by the Nonpartisan League, which was an offshoot of the Socialist Party. It withstood a early onslaught from Wall Street opponents who wanted to get rid of it, but it has become institutionalized in that state's banking ecosystem. So it, in, during the financial crisis in 2008, it was able to help ensure that North Dakota weathered the crisis better than almost any other state. It had a very low rate of foreclosures, very few bank uh, closures, almost none, I think. Uh, it helps provide students with student loans. It provides community banks. It backstops community banks so that they have a thriving local banking system in North Dakota. So there's a movement, there's a bottom-up movement for public banking in the United States, which we very much support and we're very much excited about. Uh, there also needs to be a top-down solution as well to solve the issue of the large Wall Street banks. So when there's another financial crisis, what do we do with the Wall Street banks? So the United States also has experience with public ownership or nationalization in the context of financial crises. Several times in the past decades, when a large bank has gone down, the United States government has stepped in and nationalized or quasi-nationalized uh, that bank. Uh, most recently during the financial crisis where we bailed out a lot of banks, but we also took ownership stakes in several very, very large financial institutions. And the issue that happened is that the United States government was so ideologically opposed to calling this a nationalization or taking these into public ownership that they broke every rule in the book in terms of how to do this uh, that has been taught and learned internationally. So these were messy. There was very unclear legal authority. Uh, the U.S. government gave up its voting rights and gave up control over these organ institutions, and they tried to return them as quick as possible to private ownership no matter what, uh, no matter what the cost. Um, and that had a lot to do with who was advising Obama at the time. 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, we talked in part one about the financial power of the large Wall Street banks. Uh, what we didn't really get into is that the Obama administration and the Trump administration and every administration uh, going back decades has had a lot of their senior advisors who are drawn from Wall Street, who are drawn from these very large banks to the point where the U.S. government is jokingly referred to as government sacks at, at this point, given the high number of people in high levels of the U.S. government drawn from that bank. As you said, there are lots of examples out there that they could have drawn from and used the moment to at least partially own some of these banks so that they could have greater control as to how they worked within the financial sector. But that didn't happen. But there are international examples of public banking that one could have also uh, taken into consideration, but they didn't. But tell us some examples of those. Yeah, exactly. So around the world, public banking is very common. Uh, in the United States and the UK, it's not as common. But in places like Germany and Japan uh, and in places in South America, you have a long and rich tradition of public banking. In Germany, there are around 400 or so uh, public municipal savings banks called the Sparkassen. Uh, in the European Union as a whole, uh, there is around 200 or so public or quasi-public banks that have around a fifth of all assets uh, in uh, the European Union, all of all banking assets within the European Union. Uh, the Japan Post Bank is a very, very large public bank. It was partially privatized, but is still mm -hmm. a majority publicly owned bank that is one of that nation's uh, largest employers and is one of the world's uh, largest public banks. South America, as I mentioned, has several large public banks. And these are relatively successful. These are relatively uncontroversial. And they've been around for a long time. As I said, there's a rich tradition. These are not new flash in the pan kind of experiments. These are these have very long roots within these particular countries. And the United States, as I mentioned, has, again, has one bank, the Bank of North Dakota, which does have this very long tradition and is uncontroversial and has a lot of benefit so there's a lot to be learned both from international examples and from the United States example with the Bank of North Dakota. Now, what's so exciting about your proposal is um, you pre-speak it before the crisis and you talk about getting prepared for the next crisis. So what needs to happen in terms of preparedness? Exactly. So the financial crisis represents, or the next financial crisis, will represent an opportunity to do things differently. If we don't come up with a plan, if we do not prepare for the next financial crisis, it's going to be a rerun of 2008. We will be giving large amounts of public taxpayer money to these large financial institutions with very few strings attached. They will sit there. They will wait out the crisis. They know they have nothing to fear from the government. Then they will go back to doing exactly the same thing, and the structure of the industry will remain exactly the same, and all of the ill effects of the financial crisis will be borne by the people, just like in 2008 high unemployment, foreclosure, so on and so forth, while the big banks and their investors make you know, billions and billions of dollars. So what we need to think about now in advance of the next financial crisis is how would we like to do that differently? And what we're proposing in this proposal is that instead of bailouts, when the banks come running to the government asking for a handout, asking to be saved from collapse, that we provide them with capital, but we take ownership stakes in those banks with full voting rights in exchange. And this need not necessarily be temporary. You know, in the last crisis, we did this. We did quasi-nationalizations. We did them very messily, and they were temporary. We're asking for this legislation for, to start planning for what long-term public ownership might look like of financial institutions. And uh, how receptive are legislators to this kind of a proposal? Yeah, so, you know, on the face of it, <laughs> this does not have high prospects for success in the current political atmosphere, especially with Republicans in control of most branches of government in Washington, D.C. A crisis, a financial crisis, represents an opportunity. All bets are off, all cards are on the table in a financial crisis. So we are talking about doing some of the 
back work, the research, some of working out some of the technical details of what this proposal might look like now in advance of a crisis, even if it's been introduced and never made it out of committee, even if it's you know never even been introduced in Congress, when there's another financial crisis, this could be dusted off, brought off the shelf, introduced either as legislation in advance of any rescue package or tacked onto a rescue package as an amendment. During the last financial crisis, there was an amendment, the Safe Banking Amendment, which argued for breaking up the big banks. Uh, we don't believe breaking up the big banks would work. Uh, we believe that the political power, the political institutional power of the big banks precludes breaking them up. And if there was a financial crisis, you wouldn't want to just break up big banks. First, you have to save the big banks, then you could break them up. So you could bring them into public ownership, then potentially they could be broken up. But public ownership would be a prerequisite for that. But the safe banking amendment got 33 senators to sign on to it, which is seems pretty crazy now that 33 senators in Washington would sign up to break up the biggest banks in the United States. But it did happen. So we believe that such an amendment, next time there's a financial crisis, could be introduced and it could get some success. Also, you need to think about how the American people feel about bank bailouts, and they hate them. <laughs> uh, you, you have polling and studies now that show that you know, 70, 80 percent of Americans oppose future bank bailouts, even the, knowing what we know now about the severity of the financial crisis in 2008. Most Americans, a majority, over 50 percent, believe it was not a good idea to bail out the banks during the last financial crisis. In fact, a majority during the financial crisis, they did some polling, a majority were asked that they, you know, they would like the government to take ownership of banks with full voting rights rather than just handing out money in bank bailouts. So, you know, the Tea Party, Occupy Wall Street, uh, all the movements now, I, th I believe that if there's another financial crisis, that public support for public ownership as opposed to bank bailouts would be even greater than it was in 2008. Jesse Eisinger is an award-winning senior reporter and editor at ProPublica. He and a colleague won the Pulitzer Prize for National Reporting for a series of stories on the questionable Wall Street practices that helped make the financial crisis the worst since the Great Depression. The book we're going to be discussing today is his latest, The Chicken Shit Club, Why the Justice Department Fails to Prosecute Executives. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Jesse Eisinger. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, let's get right into the title of your book, which comes from a very private meeting between uh, the new U.S. attorney for the District of Manhattan, James Comey, who later became FBI director and then was fired by Donald Trump. But one of his first meetings with the attorneys in his office, what happened? Yeah, this is going back to 2002. He had just been appointed U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York. And the Southern District, you have to understand, you know, the Department of Justice is 94 offices around the country, most of them led by a U.S. Attorney. Uh, then there's Washington, led by the Attorney General. And U.S. Attorneys are unto themselves. They think of themselves as really kind of people who want to ignore Washington as much as possible. And so they really are kind of ship's captains. And Comey was a towering figure, kind of literally at that point, six foot seven. And he gathers all these people together. And in the Southern District of New York, they think of themselves as the hot shots, the best of the best, the elite trial lawyers of the country and the, uh, the best prosecutors in the land. And so he gathers all the criminal prosecutors together and he says, I want to make a few remarks before we get started. And if you guys have followed Comey's career or followed him, you know, listeners probably have seen him since he got fired by Donald Trump. You know, he likes to hear himself talk. He's certainly no stranger to the spotlight and likes it. So he begins by saying, well, how many of you guys have never lost a case? And a bunch of these hands shoot up because they're very proud of their record and they're so and these go-getters think of themselves as so good at this. And he looks around the room and he says, well, me and my buddies have a name for you guys. You're the chicken shit club. 
and the hands go down and they slump in their chairs, probably for the first time since third grade. And they're listening. You know, and what does Comey mean by that? Well, he means that your job is not about winning. It's certainly not about winning at all costs. It's not about racking up an undefeated record. Your job is about doing justice. And doing justice requires ambition. It requires going after the biggest, most significant wrongdoers in the country. And sometimes you will lose those cases, and that's okay. That sometimes a point can be made by the government bringing a difficult case, an ambitious case against a significant or important or powerful wrongdoer. And my argument in the book is that over the subsequent 15 years to today, 16 years now, the Department of Justice has become the chicken shit club writ large when it comes to top corporate executives from the largest companies in the country. We do not prosecute them anymore. We have done a better job in the past. I'm sure we'll talk about that. But today yes. we do a very poor job, and there's been a collapse in this kind of prosecution. And we're in a corporate crime wave, whether it's the drug companies, the oil companies, the banks, the insurance companies. They are getting away with criminal or criminogenic behavior, civil fraud, billing fraud, for example. Look at your credit card situation, invasions of privacy. They tie you up in fine print contracts. They keep you from going to court with compulsory arbitration agreements. But you said they don't do this anymore that is prosecuting. And that's what I want to ask you, because back in the 1980s, with the savings and loan scandal, thousands of them failing in a high interest environment, they couldn't make it. But there are a lot of shenanigans. What was the Justice Department and the Securities Exchange Commission and the banking agencies doing then by comparison? Then we'll compare this amazing decline in law and order and law enforcement vis-a-vis -vis these corporate crooks today. Well, they did a better job. Now, I don't think there's ever been a goal. I say in my book, there's never been a golden age where the rich and powerful really had to fear for their liberty if they committed crimes. But there have been silver ages, and we have done a significantly better job in past busts. And the savings and loan scandal, as you say, we prosecuted over a thousand individuals, many of the top executives from the biggest financial institutions that were involved in that crisis. And that was because the Justice Department and the regulators put an enormous amount of resources into investigating and prosecuting those crimes, and they focused on individuals. And there are other examples of this in the wake of the junk bond scandal in the 80s, right around the same time as the savings and loan scandal. They prosecuted arguably the most powerful figure on Wall Street at the time, Michael Milken. They also prosecuted partners at Goldman Sachs. They brought a Goldman Sachs trader off the trading floor in handcuffs. They prosecuted lawyers associated with that scandal. In the wake of the Enron, WorldCom, Adelphia, Tyco, those accounting scandals of the late 1990s and early 2000s, a kind of pandemic of accounting fraud. They prosecuted almost all the top executives from almost all the big companies that were implicated in those scandals. And then in the wake of the financial crisis, there were no top bankers from large banks involved in the financial crisis who were prosecuted personally. And that was the thing that got me so puzzled and outraged and why I wrote the book. And not only you, but the vast majority of the American people. The polls show 90% of the people want to break up the big banks that are too big to fail. And that means a lot of conservatives and liberals and all kinds of political persuasions. But in your book, we're talking with Jesse Eisinger. He has written this book, The Chicken Shit Club, Why the Justice Department Fails to Prosecute Executives. And the distinction is indictment and then a trial compared to negotiating a deal between these corporations and their corporate law firms. And so I, I want to read just a section from your introduction, Jesse, and I'm quoting. 
Quote, since 2001, more than 250 federal prosecutions have involved large corporations. These include some of the biggest names in corporate America, AIG, Google, J.P. Morgan Chase, and Pfizer among them. The majority of these have been negotiated deals, not indictments, from 2000 through the fall of 2016. The Justice Department entered into 419 such settlements called Deferred Prosecution and Non-Prosecution Agreements with Corporations, end quote. Why don't you discuss this incredible ability of these corporate law firms to maneuver Justice Department lawyers who don't have the biggest budgets and the greatest number of lawyers into these non-prosecution agreements or deferred prosecution Yeah, so what has replaced prosecuting individual executives, prosecuting CEOs and chair people of the corporations, are these negotiated settlements. Now, one of the things is the prosecutors say, well, these aren't negotiated settlements, they're actually prosecutions. And so the nomenclature is a little bit different, but really what they are is the corporation writes a check and a piece of paper is put in a drawer by the prosecutors and the prosecutors say, well, we could prosecute you, but we're not going to for now. And we want to watch you to see if you behave yourselves. And now my argument is that this has replaced the prosecutions of individuals and that this fundamentally does not work. It is a regime that is broken. And the reason we know it doesn't work is that we see recidivist corporations. We see corporations breaking rules repeatedly and getting sanctioned and then breaking them again. But J.P. Morgan, Pfizer, BP, these companies, many other companies are recidivists. They have broken rules and been accused of crimes and sometimes pled guilty to crimes over and over again and still commit wrongdoing. So this is a regime that just does not work. Fraud is still not treated as if it were a real crime, even though these elite frauds cause greater financial losses than all other forms of property crime combined. This is Bill Black, a former regulator. He says the reason more bankers aren't in jail is because fraud is not taken seriously. What people need to understand is that in every country, the United States is actually the best in this in terms of resources, and we are horribly inadequate. Out of a million and a half people employed in our criminal justice system, 2,300 actually do elite white-collar crime investigations, so a tiny, tiny handful. But if fraud is so difficult to prove, isn't it a waste of resources to spend money on cases that can't be won? Well, Bill Black says they can. Anytime you go up against elite white-collar criminals, they have the best criminal defense lawyers in the world. It is not easy to convict them. But it is also not impossible, and that's why we had a 90% conviction rate against the most elite frauds that uh, were tried in U.S. history as a group. Yes, you heard right. A 90% conviction rate. You see, Bill Black wasn't just any regulator. He became one of the most famous regulators in the world. He led the effort to expose congressional corruption during the savings and loan crisis in the 1980s. It was one of the largest financial scandals in America. And it made him a target. (laughs) <laughs> you know, get black, kill him dead, uh, private detectives pursuing you, and the second most powerful elected official in the United States of America making it his mission to try to get you fired and referring to you constantly as the redheaded SOB and attacking you publicly in the press. The crisis led to hundreds of savings and loans companies becoming insolvent and a multi billion dollar bailout from the federal government. But it also led to prosecutions. We helped uh, over a thousand convictions, just the cases designated as major. 
And those cases were hyper-prioritized to go after the worst of the worst. We called it the top 100 list of the worst fraud schemes in the nation. It involved roughly 300 financial institutions and 600 individuals. And how senior were those people? All the way to uh, chairman of board of directors, president, CEOs, and indeed a former governor of the state of Illinois. So, if prosecutors could prove fraud then, why not now? Is it because the types of fraud carried out have got more complex? Actually, the frauds have gotten far simpler. One was liar's loans. And these are loans in which you didn't verify the borrower's income. Well, there's nothing terribly subtle or complex about a liar's loan. So that's an easy fraud to prove. The second is appraisal fraud to inflate the supposed market value of the collateral that's being pledged to safeguard the loan. If you're going to sell them to the secondary market, you can't say, hi, I'm selling you a a fraudulent loan. So you have to make fraudulent representations and warranties. And that's the third great epidemic. And there's nothing subtle about any of those things. The high-profile convictions didn't do Bill Black's career much good. He's now teaching at a small university in Missouri, a thousand miles from Washington, D.C., He's not been asked to share his expertise with the Obama administration on how to prosecute fraudulent bankers. But if he were, he says he would advise them to reintroduce the criminal referral process, where regulators lay out why prosecutions can be brought. In the savings and loan crisis, just our federal agency made over 30,000 criminal referrals to get that over a 1,000 felony convictions in the current crisis, which is well over a 100 times larger than the savings and loan crisis. The same federal agency, the Office of Thrift Supervision, made zero criminal referrals. The Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, which is the U.S. agency that is supposed to regulate the largest national banks, made zero criminal referrals. The Federal Reserve, which is supposed to regulate the largest bank holding companies, made zero criminal referrals. And the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation is smart enough to refuse to answer the question. So the reason that fraudulent bankers in America aren't going to jail isn't just because prosecutors aren't pursuing those cases. It's because further back along the line, regulators aren't making criminal referrals in the first place. Bill Black says this is because fraud isn't taken seriously enough. If he's right, then we have to take this inquiry in a new direction. Finding out why fraud isn't seen as a priority takes us away from lawyers and regulators into the world of politics. Part 3. The Revolving Door The other bill that I'm signing today gives prosecutors and regulators new tools to crack down on what's helped cause this crisis in the first place. And that's the President Curtis Obama in 2009, Trump, four months Trump. in office and barely a gray hair in sight, announcing a new law designed to jail those who'd committed financial fraud. So with that, I'm going to sign the Fraud Enforcement Recovery Act along with these extraordinary legislators who helped to make it happen. Give them a big round of applause. Basking in the applause... Our next expert witness, Senator Ted Kaufman. That moment, I felt absolutely great because I had done everything I could. I'd used everything I'd learned in 40 years hanging in the Senate, all my education, in order to help get something like this passed. And when the act was signed, you said, Today marks a turning point. Our prosecutors will soon have the resources they need to find, prosecute and jail those who've committed financial fraud. Those who illegally lined their pockets and left millions of Americans with the devastating consequences will pay the price. If someone had said to you five years ago when you made that speech that no senior bankers in Wall Street would be in jail now, what would you have said to them? I'm incredibly disappointed. Here's what happened. While everyone in the Justice Department was testifying before me in the hearings in judiciary and saying publicly that their top priority was going after fraud enforcement, here's what the Inspector General for the Department of Justice reported during that period. The Department of Justice ranked criminal complex financial crimes 
as the lowest of the six ranked criminal threats with the area responsibility and ranked mortgage fraud as the lowest subcategory threat within the complex financial crimes category. So essentially, it was government policy of the Department of Justice, as reported by the Inspector General, that while leaders in the department were saying that this was a high priority, it was not just not their highest priority, it was their lowest priority. It was a shock for the senator, who thought that the new law he'd helped draft would herald a new era of accountability and the secrecy surrounding the way in which prosecutors make decisions about which cases to pursue means it's not easy to challenge them. One of the most sensitive areas of of government in the United States is what we call prosecutorial discretion. If you're in the government and you have to make a decision on whether to prosecute someone or how to prosecute them, each individual prosecutor makes those decisions alone. The Congress has no oversight over prosecutorial discretion. So if you're a prosecutor... No one ever knows, in many cases, why you did or didn't prosecute. Why they didn't prosecute anybody at the banks when the banks have paid over $150 billion in fines and no one's been prosecuted. So he can't be sure why prosecutors aren't pursuing fraudulent bankers. But he does have a theory. They had a gigantic conflict of interest. Many of the lawyers in the Department of Justice and in the Securities Exchange Commission had come from Wall Street and were going to go back to Wall Street after they left. So the real gigantic conflict of interest was decisions they made while they were in the Justice Department, the Security Exchange Commission, with one eye on the fact that they were going to have to get a job afterwards back in the law firms that they were dealing with. Uh, There's a disturbing number of people in those positions who have gone back to work on Wall Street on the very firms they're negotiating with. Although he's no longer a senator, Ted Kaufman hasn't given up on the issue of prosecuting fraudulent bankers. It's often the subject of his weekly newspaper column. He argues that without prosecutions, the culture that led to the financial crisis won't change. Prosecutions are so important not for revenge. Prosecutions are important as a deterrent. The idea that no one went to jail for this means that people are in place all over the financial community who engaged in fraud and got away free. So if you're sitting in a meeting today, and someone says, here, we got a special deal we can run, because they're back doing the same kind of risky things they were doing before. I got a deal we can run today. It's not going to be quite in the up and up. And one person says, well, wait a minute, we can go to jail for that. And they all laugh because nobody went to jail. I mean, nobody. I'm not saying everybody should go to jail. I'm not saying a whole lot of people to jail, but nobody went to jail. We've just heard clips today, starting with Angie Coiro sitting in on the broadcast discussing the risks banks knew they were taking before the crash and the inequality that has spiked in its wake. This is Hell spoke with Nomi Prinz about the wrong-headed structure of the bank bailouts. The Brian Lehrer Show talked with David Leonhardt about, among other things, the need for a more robust set of economic indicators to replace GDP. Start Making Sense interviewed Harold Meyerson on why the recovery helped to solidify many of the worst parts of our economic system. Laura Flanders mused that the end of capitalism seems easier to imagine now, 10 years after the crash. The Real News Network talked with Thomas Hanna about the plan to seize rather than bail out the banks during the next crash. The Ralph Nader Radio Hour had on Jesse Isinger to discuss his book, The Chicken Shit Club, that helps explain why there were almost no prosecutions for fraud in the wake of the crash. And finally, we just heard The Inquiry discussing even more answers to the same question. As always, you can find links to each of these segments in the show notes for easy reference and sharing. And now we'll hear from you. This is Jeff T., longtime listener and supporter from New York. Jay, I love the show, but I disagree with your response to my call a few weeks ago regarding differentiating social democracy from democratic socialism. While you ask us to keep the comments coming and state that all comments are worthy, you indicated that you don't like this topic and that you'd rather discuss specific issues. I therefore don't know if you'll air my comment but at least you'll hear it and perhaps conclude that I'm not just engaging in an abstract semantical discussion. 
in my original comment, I referred to David Pakman's statements that we must clear up the confusion between the social democracy that he supports and democratic socialism. He made these comments on his July 5th and July 16th shows in which he differentiated between democratic socialism that calls for government ownership of the means of production and social democracy practiced in the Scandinavian countries that calls for a market economy combined with a strong social safety net, regulated economics, universal health care and education. I'll also refer to Paul Krugman, who recently wrote, and I quote, it's true that Denmark doesn't at all fit the classic definition of socialism, which involves government ownership of the means of production. It is instead social democratic, a market economy where the downsides of capitalism are mitigated by government action, including a very strong social safety net. The same may be said for some democratic politicians. Much has been made of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, not just because of her upset primary victory, but because she's a self-proclaimed socialist. Her platform, however, isn't socialist at all by the traditional definition. It's just unabashedly social democratic, unquote. I'll also refer to a letter in the New York Times regarding the growing popularity of socialism. The writer stated, by confusing their brand of socialism with the traditional meaning of government ownership of the means of production, we stand to lose millions of voters if only they would drop the label and call themselves social or liberal Democrats, they would be more likely to appeal to older New Deal Democrats who feel unrepresented in the current political domain, unquote. I personally can relate to this. I was recently speaking to someone who stated that political figures such as Sanders and Ocasio-Cortez are going too far in calling for socialism. I told her that actually they are social Democrats and explained the difference. Unfortunately, socialism has been used as a scare word by the right. I agree with Pacman that referring to social democracy can help clear up some of this confusion and resistance to the platform of progressive Democrats. You stated that Sanders calls himself a socialist. The fact is, however, that he uses the word incorrectly. You also spoke about the flexibility of terms. There is a danger, however, of stretching a term to the point that it becomes meaningless. Finally, at times, you featured Professor Richard Wolff calling for workers' collectives as an alternative to capitalism. No progressive would argue with that. But it's difficult to conceive of an entire society in which workers have enough capital to make the dominant feature of the economy. So if we reject classical socialism as anachronistic, we do have this one clear alternative to the unregulated capitalism that is practiced in America and rightly criticized on best of the left, and that is social democracy. We do ourselves a disservice simply advocating various disparate positions without clearly defining and advocating for an overarching progressive orientation. Thank you. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks to the volunteers who helped gather clips to make this show possible. Thanks to Amanda Hoffman for all of her work on our social media outlets and activism segments. And thanks to all those who called into the voicemail line. If you'd like to leave a comment or question of your own to be played on the show, you can simply record a message at 202-999-3991. Now let's uh, continue this conversation with Jeff from New York. He is absolutely right. Last time he called in, I didn't get into the weeds or really address his concerns head on because I sort of wanted to dismiss the discussion as a distraction. That is still basically my uh, opinion and my conclusion, but I'm happy to get into the weeds at least for just a moment. Uh, The part of his message that really stuck out to me was his claim that democratic socialism calls for government ownership of the means of production. And because I'm getting into the weeds and I decided to look up definitions of things, uh, I could not find evidence that that was true. So I I looked up, first of all, socialism. Let's just try to have a shared understanding of the definition of socialism. So I'm just going to Wikipedia. I I figured, you know, this is a hot button topic. You can have arguments on uh, Wikipedia 
I figured if there were an argument happening, it would be happening there. And this seems to be the consensus definition. So uh, socialism is a range of economic and social systems characterized by social ownership and workers' self-management of the means of production, as well as the political theories and movements associated with them. Social ownership may refer to forms of public, collective, or cooperative ownership, or to a citizen ownership of equity. There are many varieties of socialism, and there is no single definition encapsulating all of them, though social ownership is the common element shared by its various forms. So I, I've never heard that, end quote. So I've never heard a definition that made more sense to me than that. I have always thought of socialism as an umbrella term to describe a range, I mean, just as it says, a range of economic and social systems. And there are threads that connect all of those, but to say, I believe in socialism, or to say this country is socialist, gives you like next to no information about how uh, how a person really believe, you know, what, what policies they really believe or how a country actually operates. You really have to get down to the policy level to understand which form of socialism uh, they believe in. And I think that people are confused about this very, very understandably, especially the older generation who lived through the Cold War, because the Soviet style, the, the Soviet model of socialism became inextricably linked with the definition of socialism. People call it the classic definition of socialism, as Jeff did, and that is simply not the case. And I don't think it ever has been. I think that socialism was always a range of ideas. The Soviet Union chose one of them and pursued it. And then everyone got confused just because, I mean, it was so dominant, like the Soviet Union was so dominant in the world that to think, okay, socialism means what they are doing, but it really doesn't. It just means that was one of the ways that socialism can manifest itself. Okay. So on to social democracy here, we totally agree. Like social democracy, that's basically what all Western countries are just to varying degrees. Think of FDR, New Deal era policies like Social Security and Medicaid, Medicare, uh, or Scandinavia, like strong social programs to offset the downsides of capitalism. That's what social democracy believes in. And then the big difference between social democracy and democratic socialism is the democratic socialists believe in all of that stuff from social democracy, but they also think we should have a, a fundamental transformation in the form of ownership into social ownership. Okay, so what's social ownership? Again, this is sort of covered in the definition of uh, socialism, but social ownership, again, from Wikipedia, quoting, social ownership is any of various forms of ownership for the means of production in socialist economic systems encompassing public ownership, employee ownership, cooperative ownership, citizen ownership of equity, common ownership, and collective ownership, unquote. So clearly, we don't have to go into the definitions of all of those to see that the concept of social ownership encompasses a lot more than government ownership. So I can't find any evidence that Bernie Sanders or Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or anyone else is using the definitions of these terms incorrectly and that they are secretly actually social democrats and wrongly identify themselves as democratic socialists because they do believe in pushing for policies that will encourage more cooperative ownership. They just do. That's part of their policy platforms. So they believe in all of the social democracy stuff plus a transformation of the dominant style of ownership from private to cooperative or something else. No one, essentially no one believes in government ownership of corporations the way the Soviet Union Im implemented. You just can't find people who will espouse that belief anymore. So it's very understandable that people who lived through the Cold War would associate socialism with government ownership, but it doesn't mean that's the definition of the word, and it certainly doesn't mean that's what anyone is pushing for today. And, and I mean, J Jeff agrees. Like, he knows Bernie Sanders isn't pushing for government ownership of, of corporations, but 
he then thinks that Bernie Sanders is using the term wrong, and I can't find any evidence that that's true. Now, his, his second concern is that people are going to be confused. You know, Jeff gives the example that he spoke to a woman who's nervous about Bernie Sanders because of all that democratic socialism he keeps talking about. And to that, I say, of course, of course, people are confused. Like, it would be shocking if people weren't confused. But this is where we get back to my main point, which is you should stop worrying so much about the labels and worry more about the policies. All these terms signify a range of ideas. So you're going to have to get down to the policy level no matter what. So yeah, people are confused. They're going to be confused. Even if you use the terms as precisely as possible, people are still going to not know what they are exactly and need to have it explained to them. Or even in the best case scenario, the right is going to constantly try to scaremonger and confuse people on purpose. Right now, the, the word has gone out that Democrats are radical leftists running in the 2018 election. They're radical leftists and they're all in favor of socialized medicine, neither of which is true. But the right knows that those terms poll as being scary. So that's what they're going to do. They're always going to do it. And trying to be exactly precise is not the way to avoid confusion. And then the last point that Jeff seemed to make is that cooperative ownership doesn't seem very feasible because it's hard to imagine a world in which workers get enough money together to buy or start their own uh, cooperative businesses. And, and to that, I, I say, I think that's a lack of imagination or, or just a, a misunderstanding of how that can work. I mean, people don't need to suddenly become rich to collectively buy or start a company. They would borrow the money just like anyone else. So private banks, or if the government were serious about encouraging cooperative ownership, public banks could be set up at the state or federal level to give loans to groups of people looking to purchase or start cooperative businesses. So aside from Bernie Sanders, like Richard Wolf came up in this conversation, he has never said anything about banning private ownership. He explicitly says he envisions a future economy where cooperatives and privately owned businesses coexist and compete against each other. All we're talking about is implementing policies that help encourage more cooperative businesses because there are all kinds of benefits to it. And the reasons that they haven't already exploded and everyone's clamoring to be part of a cooperative business is because of First of all, decades of propaganda that uh, individualism is the best and we should all be thankful for the terrible jobs we have and the total lack of democracy that we experience in the workplace. And then at the policy level, the owners of privately owned businesses use their wealth and power to lobby the government and make sure the government doesn't pass policies that would be favorable to cooperative businesses. So we've got a few hurdles to clear, but honestly, not that many. Uh, it, it's more of an awareness campaign that this other model exists. You would like it much more, and it's not that hard to get to. We sort of just need a few tweaks to the system to unleash a lot of energy into the cooperative sector of the economy, because not only do people like Bernie Sanders and uh, Richard Wolff agree with this, as I've played on the show many times, Ronald Reagan gave speeches talking about the benefits of employee ownership. Like This is not actually a controversial topic. It's just that those who would not win in that situation, i.e. people who already own privately owned businesses and don't want to compete against cooperatives, have been working to convince us for decades that we shouldn't move in that direction. So to recap, I can't find any evidence that Bernie Sanders or anyone else is using the terms socialism or democratic socialism incorrectly. Uh, I absolutely agree that people are going to be confused, but this just brings me back to my original point from the last time we had this conversation that the way to unconfuse people is to talk about policies and not labels. And, and then thirdly, the path forward is not as fraught as many people think it is. Um, Jeff seems to think that it's hard to imagine a world in, in which cooperative ownership could become widespread, even though he would be in favor of it. And I, I just think that we shouldn't let that drag us down and have us settle for merely social democracy when the fundamentals of capitalism are always going to perpetuate a battle 
between the downsides of capitalism and the social democratic policies that try to offset those downsides. Like we implemented the New Deal era decades ago and they've been chipping away at it ever since. So our social safety net is more and more and more threadbare and that is always going to be the cycle until you break that cycle by breaking the dominant form of ownership. And that seems like something worth fighting for. And now, as Jeff pointed out, I do always say keep the comments coming in at 202-999-3991. That's going to be it for today. Thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks to those who support the show by becoming a member or making donations of any size at patreon.com slash bestofleft. That is absolutely how the program survives. Of course, everyone can support the show just by telling everyone you know about it and leaving us glowing reviews on Apple Podcasts and Facebook to help others find the show. For details on the show itself, including links to all of the sources and music used in this and every episode, all that information can always be found in the show notes on the blog and likely right on the device you're using to listen. So coming to you from far outside the conventional wisdom of Washington, D.C., my name is Jay, and this has been the Best of the Left podcast coming to you every Tuesday and Friday, thanks entirely to the members and donors to the show from bestofleft.com. Bestofleft.com.